They come to talk, some of us really come to die, dude. Are you willing to die for a YouTube shit? Yeah, but that's what's gonna come, man. Death is coming to you, dude. You can't you can't just talk tough. You also have to walk it, and and by and not by tough and intimidation, but by presenting yourself. The Years of Lead was a period of political turmoil in Italy, ranging from the late 60s to the early 80s, that was heavily impacted by incidents of left-wing and right-wing political violence. During this period, bombings, shootings, assassinations, and large, often fatal street battles were commonplace. This unsettling account of history shows how political violence can get out of hand in a nation with two highly polarized factions. Given how the divide in American society and some other nations around the world is only getting deeper, and acts of politically motivated violence are becoming more common, this is quite possibly our dark future. We either reverse course soon, or suffer our own years of lead. The years of lead are believed to have began in 1969 with the hot autumn strikes of the workers in industrial areas of northern Italy. During one of these left-leaning protests, an Italian police officer, Antonio Anaruma, was killed by the protesters. On December 12, 1969, a bomb exploded at the headquarters of the National Agrarian Bank in the Piazza Fontana building, which claimed the lives of 17 people. The leftist groups claimed that the right-wing groups were responsible, and vice versa. However, all the trials never fully confirmed which side carried out the bombings. This was followed by the death of an anarchist named Giuseppe Pinelli, who was associated with the leftist group Ponte della Giosofa, while he was in police custody. His group was suspected to be involved with the Piazza Fontana bombing initially by the authorities. The officer suspected in Giuseppe's death was Luigi Calabrese. Although Luigi was exonerated in the death of Giuseppe, the far left news outlet Lada Continua made Luigi the focus of a media campaign that constantly reported that he was guilty. Showing the power of media, leftist activists shot Calabrese to death on his way to work in Milan on May 17th of 1972. This act began the chapter of assassinations carried out by far-left groups. In August 1970, Mara Cagol and Renato Curico along with Alberto Francesini, founded the group known as the Red Brigades. The Red Brigades were comprised mostly of former members of the communist youth movement that were expelled for their overly extreme views. Initially, the Red Brigades conducted non-violent corporate sabotage inside of companies like Siemens, Pirelli, Fiat, and Magneti Morelli. Red Brigade members would often sabotage equipment in these companies and steal vital information from factory offices and trade union headquarters. In 1972, the Red Brigades upped their game to kidnapping. The group kidnapped a factory foreman at Siemens and made him wear a placard that proclaimed he was a fascist. This man was not a fascist, but communistic anti-fascist groups are known to label anyone they dislike a fascist. On March 26, 1971, Alessandro Flores was assassinated in Genoa by a unit of the October 22nd Group, a far-left terrorist organization. 
An amateur photographer had taken a photo of the killer that enabled the police to identify the terrorists. This group was investigated and more members arrested. Some fled to Milan and joined the GAP and later the Red Brigades. The Red Brigades considered the October 22nd group its predecessor, and in April 1974 they kidnapped Judge Mario Sassi in a failed attempt at freeing their jailed members. Years later, the Red Brigades killed Judge Francesco Coco on June 8, 1976, along with his two police escorts. During this time, the Red Brigade's activities were denounced by far-left political groups such as Lada Continua and Poteri al Pronio. Although there has been an attempt to demonstrate a link between the Red Brigades and foreign communist state security services, nothing has been proved and such an idea has always been rejected by all the militants after their years of prison who decided to speak their truth in books, interviews, etc. In June 1974, the Red Brigades took action as two members of the Italian neo-fascist party, MSI, were killed in Padua during a raid on the MSI headquarters. Initially, an internal feud between neo-fascist groups was suspected since the crime had occurred in the city of Franco Frida. However, the murder was then claimed by the Red Brigades. It was the first person-to-person -person murders of the organization, which had until then only committed robberies, bombings, and kidnappings. Most of the Italian left-wing political parties of the time, including the Italian Communist Party PCI, denied the Red Brigade's involvement in the murder, and even the Red Brigade's existence itself. However, according to the Red Brigade leaders, the Red Brigade received support from a large number of people, and this would be the reason for such a long existence of a military structure that counted a few hundred effective members. The Red Brigades operated some high-profile political kidnappings and kidnapped industrialists in order to obtain ransom money, which together with bank robberies were their main source of income. After 1974, the Red Brigades expanded into Rome, Genoa, and Venice. Their numbers grew drastically, and they began to diversify in their criminal ventures. Bank robberies, kidnappings, drug and arms trafficking were the major crimes. The Red Brigade's 1975 manifesto stated that its goal was a concentrated strike at the heart of the state because the state is an imperialist collection of multinational corporations. Farmhouse where the industrialist Valerino Genica was kept prisoner by the Red Brigades. In the ensuing gunfight, Two police officers were killed, as was Mara Kegel, one of the founding members. That following April, the Red Brigades announced that they had set up a communist combatant party to, quote, guide the working class. Terrorist activities, especially against law enforcement and magistrates, increased considerably in order to terrorize juries and cause mistrials in the cases against the prison leaders of the organization. Also, since arrested members of the brigades refused to be defended by lawyers, Lawyers designated by the courts to defend them were also targeted and killed. Among jurists, Professor Fausto Cucuolo was also attacked in 1979 during an exam at the University of Genoa. It was the first time that the Red Brigades attacked in a school. The Golepi Borghesi was a failed coup allegedly planned for the 7th or the 8th of December 1970. It was named after Junio Valero Borghesi, an Italian World War II commander, also known as the Black Prince. Junio was convicted of fighting with Nazi Germany, but not of the war crimes, and was still a hero in the eyes of many of the post-war Italian fascists. The coup attempt became publicly known when the left-wing journal Passe Sera ran the headline on the evening of March 18, 1971, Subversive Plan Against the Republic, Far-Right Plot Discovered. The secret operation was codenamed Operation Tora Tora after the Japanese attack on U.S. ships in Pearl Harbor, which had led the United States to enter the Second World War on December 7, 1941. The plan of the coup in its final phase envisions the involvement of the U.S. and NATO warships which were on alert in the Mediterranean. However, only a few marginalized sectors of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency were in favor of the coup, while the main response was not to allow major changes in the geopolitical balance in the Mediterranean. The botched right-wing coup took place after the hot autumn of the left-wing protests in Italy and the Piazza Fontana bombing in December 1969. The failed attempt involved hundreds of neo-fascist militants from the Stefano Delle Chile National Vanguard, helped by 187 members 
of the Corpo Forestal dello Stato, who were to seize the headquarters of the Italian public television broadcaster RIA. The plan included the kidnapping of the Italian president Giuseppe Sargat, the murder of the head of police Angelo Vicari, and the occupation of the Quirinal, the Ministry of the Interior from which the vanguard militants would seize weapons. Milan-based army dissidents in the battalion of Lt. Col. Amos Biazzi also planned to occupy Sesto San Giovanni, at the time a workers' town and a stronghold of the Italian Communist Party. Apparently some militants briefly entered the Ministry of the Interior, but Bortesi suspended the coup a few hours before its final phase. A gun not returned by one of the militants was later viewed as a key piece of evidence in the later sedition trial. According to Borghese, the neo-fascists were actually gathering for a protest demonstration against the upcoming visit of President Joseph Broz Tito of Yugoslavia, which was later postponed. This protest was supposedly called off because of heavy rain. Amos Biazzi, commander of the army dissidents, said that the coup was suspended because the Christian democratic government knew of the coup plan and was ready to suppress the plotters and declare martial law. This suppression was known in its preparatory stages as the Exigency Operation Triangle, which would be executed in accordance with the Piano Solo Plan and comprise the deployment of tens of thousands of government troops as well as military and civil police to seize control of political parties and publishers, undertake mass arrest and deportations, and effectively preempt any th perceived threats to the civil power. Thus, Borghese, lacking support of Spiazzi and his men, aborted the coup at the last minute as the plotters moved into position. Participants at the semi-clandestine rally seemed to have believed that they would take part in the arrest of politicians and the occupation of key installations by sympathetic army units. When Borghese called off the coup late that night, the presumed plotters reportedly unarmed improvised a late spaghetti dinner before returning home. Several members of the National Front were arrested and a warrant was served for Borghese. Borghese himself fled to Spain and died there in August 1974. According to several ex-Mafia state witnesses, such as Tommaso Busetti, Borghese asked the Sicilian Mafia to support the neo-fascist coup. In 1970, when the Sicilian Mafia Commission was reconstituted, one of the first issues that had to be discussed was an offer by Borghese, who asked for support in return for pardons of convicted mafiosi like Vincenzo Rimi and Luciano Liigio. The mafiosi Giuseppe Calderon and Giuseppe Di Cristina visited Borghese in Rome. However, other mafiosi, such as Gitano, some Italian last name, opposed the plan, and the mafia decided not to participate. According to mafia boss Luciano Liigio, testifying at the Maxi trial against the mafia in the mid-1980s, Tommaso Busetti and Salvatore Greco were in favor of helping Borghese. The plan was for the Mafia to carry out a series of terrorist bombings and assassinations to provide the justification for a right-wing coup. Although Liejo's version differed from Busetta's, the testimony confirmed that Borghese had requested assistance by the Mafia. According to the Pentio Francesco Di Carlo, the journalist Mauro Di Mario was killed in September 1970 because he had learned that Borghese, one of Di Mario's childhood friends, was planning the coup. On the 31st of May 1972, three Italian police officers were killed in Petiano in a bombing attributed to Lata Continua. Officers of the Carabinieri were later indicted and convicted for the perverting the course of justice. Judge Casson identified one member, Vincenzo Vinci Guerra, as a man who had planted the Petiano bomb. The neo fascist terrorist, Vinci Guerrera, arrested in the 1980s for the bombing in Petiano, declared to magistrate Felice Casson that this false flag attack had been intended to force the Italian state to declare a state of emergency and become more authoritarian. Vinci Guerra explained how the SISMI military intelligence agency had protected him, allowing him to escape to Spain. Casson's investigation revealed that the right-wing organization, Ordini Nuovo, had collaborated with the Italian Military Secret Service, SID. Together, they had engineered the Petiano attack and then blamed the Red Brigades. He confessed and testified that he had been covered by a network of sympathizers in Italy and abroad who had ensured that he could escape after the attack. A whole mechanism came into action. The Minister of the Interior, the Customs Services, and the Military and Civilian Intelligence Services accepted the ideological reasoning behind the attack. 
on April 16, 1973, an attack on the house of Mario Mattei, a neo-fascist Italian social movement militant, resulted in his two sons, aged 8 and 20, being burned alive. During a 1973 ceremony honoring Luigi Calabrese, in which the interior minister was present, Gianfranco Bertoli, an anarchist, threw a bomb that killed four and injured 45. In 1975, Bertoli was sentenced to life imprisonment. The Milan court wrote that he was embroiled in connections with the far right, that was an SID of informant and a confidant of the police. In the 1990s, it was suspected that Bertoli was a member of GLaDO, but he denied it in an interview. In the list of the 622 GLaDO members made public in 1990, his name is missing. A magistrate investigating the assassination attempt of Mariano Rumor found that Bertoli's files were incomplete. General Gianna Delio Malate, head of the SID from 1971 to 1975, was convicted in absentia in 1990 for his obstruction of justice in the Mariano Rumor case. 1974 was one of the biggest years in the years of lead that the Italians had to endure. In May 1974, a bomb exploded during an anti-fascist demonstration in Brescia, killing eight and wounding 102. On the 17th of June 1974, two members of MSI, a neo-fascist group, were murdered in Padua. Initially, an internal feud between the neo-fascist groups was suspected, since the crime had occurred in the city of Franco Frida. However, the murder was then claimed by the Red Brigades. It was the first murder of the organization, which until then had only committed robberies, bombings, and kidnappings. Count Edgardo Sogno said in his memoirs that in July 1974, he visited the CIA station chief in Rome to inform him of his preparations for a neo-fascist coup, asking what the United States government would do in case of such a coup. Sogno wrote that he was told, quote, the United States would have supported any initiative tending to keep the communists out of the government. General Maliette declared in 2001 that he had not known about Sogno's relationship with the CIA and had not been informed about the coup known as Golpe Bianco, or the White Coup. On the 4th of August 1974, the Italicus Express train was bombed, killing 12 and injuring 105. In 1974, some of the leaders of the Red Brigade, including Renato Curico and Alberto Franceschini, were arrested, but the new leadership continued the war against the Italian right-wing establishment with increased fervor. There were technical conditions for ending terrorism. However, the political class was unwilling. The Italian left wing was less worried by the existence of an armed organization than by the possible abuses by the police against protesters. It did therefore ask for the disarmament of police during street demonstrations. Also, in the ruling Christian democracy, many underestimated the threat of the Red Brigades, speaking of phantom Red Brigades, emphasizing them instead of neo-fascist groups. In 1973, a major left-wing news outlet had disbanded, although another carried on in its wake. Lata Continua also dissolved in 1976, although their magazine struggled on for several years. From the remnants of Lata Continua and similar groups, the terror organization Prima Linea emerged. This proved to many Italian people that there was a very strong correlation between media outlets and left-wing terrorism. On the 28th of February, student and rights activist Mikis Mantakas was killed by far-left activists during riots. On the 13th of March, young militant of the Italian social movement, MSI, Sergio Ramelli, was assaulted in Milan by a group of far-left activists and wounded in the head with wrenches. He died on the 29th of April after 47 days in the hospital. On the 25th of May, student and leftist activist Alberto Brasili was stabbed in Milan by neo-fascist militants. On the 5th of June, Giovanni De Alfonso, member of the Cabernet police force, was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 29th of April, lawyer and militant of MSI, Enrico Pedinovi, was killed in Milan by the organization Prima Linea, the group that was founded by the disbanded far-left news outlet. This was the first assassination conducted by Prima Linea. On the 8th of July in Rome, Judge Vittorio Accoroso was killed by a neo-fascist. On the 14th of December in Rome, policeman Francisco Palumbo was killed by the far-left group Nuclei Armatae Politerie. On the 15th of December, Ancesto San Giovanni, a town near Milan, 
Vice Chief Vittorio Padovini and Marshal Sergio Bezega were killed by a young extremist. On the 11th of March, Francesco Loreso was killed by the military police in the University of Bologna. On the 12th of March, a Turin policeman, Giuseppe Ciotta, was killed by Prima Linea. On the 22nd of March, a Rome policeman, Claudio Grezzosi, was killed by the far-left group Nuclei Armati Proletari. On the 28th of April in Turin, lawyer Fluvio Croce was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 14th of May in Milan, activists from a far-left organization pulled out their pistols and began to shoot at the police, killing policeman Antonio Custra. A photographer took a photo of an activist shooting at the police. This year was also referred to as the year of the P-38, referring to the Walther P-38 pistol. On the 16th of November in Turin, Carlo Casaligano, deputy director of the newspaper La Stampa, was seriously wounded in an ambush of the Red Brigades. He died 13 days later on November 24th. On the 4th of January, in Cassiano, Fiat Boss Security Services, Carmen de Rosa was killed by leftists. On the 7th of January in Rome, young militants of the far-right group MSI were killed by far leftists. Another militant was also killed by police during a violent demonstration. Some militants left the MSI and founded the Nuclei Armati Revolutionari, which had ties with the Roman criminal organization Banda della Magaliana. On the 20th of January in Florence, policeman Fastano Diosoni was killed by Prima Linea. On the 7th of February in Prato, a town near Florence, notary Giofranco, some Italian last name, was killed by leftists. On the 14th of February in Rome, Judge Ricardo Palama was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 10th of March in Turin, Marshal Rosario Peradini was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 11th of April in Turin, policeman Lorenzo Cotiguno was killed by the Red Brigades. On April 20th in Milan, policeman Francesco Di Cataro was killed by the Red Brigades. On October 10th in Rome, Judge Girolamo, some Italian last name, was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 11th of October in Naples, university teacher Alfredo Paola was killed by Prima Linea. On the 8th of November in Patricia, Judge Fidel Calvosa was killed by the Unitia Communiste Combatini. On March 16, 1978, Aldo Moro was kidnapped by the Red Brigades. During the kidnapping, five of his security detail were killed. Aldo Moro was a left-leaning Christian Democrat who served several times as the Prime Minister. Before his murder, he had been trying to include the Italian Communist Party in the government through a deal he called Historic Compromise. PCI, the Italian Communist Party, was at the time the largest communist party in Western Europe. This was mainly because of its non-extremist and pragmatic stance. Its growing independence from Moscow and its Euro-Communist doctrine, the PCI was especially strong in areas such as Emilia Rogomani, where it had a stable government position and mature practical experience, which may have contributed to a more pragmatic approach to politics. The Red Brigades were fiercely opposed by the Communist Party and trade unions. A few left-wing politicians even used the condescending expression, comrades who do wrong, to describe the Red Brigades. On May 9, 1978, after a summary, quote, trial of the people, Moro was murdered by the Red Brigades. The corpse was found that same day in the trunk of a red Renault 4 in Via Michelangelo Seatani in downtown Rome. A consequence of this was that the PCI did not gain executive power. Moro's assassination was followed by a large clampdown on the social movement, including the arrest of many members of left-wing groups. Active armed organizations grew from 2 in 1969 to 91 in 1977 and 269 in 1979. In that year, there were 659 attacks. 1979 was the year in the years of lead with the most assassinations. On the 19th of January, Turin policeman Giuseppe Loreso was killed by the Prima Linea organization. On January 24th, worker and trade unionist Guido Rosa was killed in Genoa by the Red Brigades. On the 29th of January, a judge was killed in Milan by Prima Linea. On March 9th, university student was killed in Turin by Prima Linea. 
On the 20th of March, a journalist was gunned down in his car in Rome. Prime Minister Giulio Andrinati and a mafia boss were sentenced in 2002 to 24 years in prison for the murder, though the sentences were overturned the following year. On the 3rd of May in Rome, two policemen were killed by the Red Brigades. On the 13th of July in Durento, a policeman was killed by Prima Linea. On the 13th of July in Rome, Lieutenant Colonel of the Cabernet was also killed by the Red Brigades. On July 18th, a bartender was killed in Turin by Prima Linea. On the 21st of September, Carlo, some Italian last name, was killed in Turin by a group of Prima Linea. On the 11th of December, five teachers and five students of the Valletta Institute in Turin were shot in the legs by Prima Linea. On the 8th of January, three Milan policemen were killed by the Red Brigades. On the 25th of January, two Genoa policemen were killed by the Red Brigades. On the 29th of January, a manager of a petrochemical plant was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 5th of February, in Monza, Paolo Paloetti was killed by Prima Linea. On the 7th of February, Prima Linea's militant, William Vacher, was killed on suspicion of treason. On the 12th of February, in Rome, De La Sapania University, Vittorio Bachet, Vice President of the Superior Council of Magistrates and former President of the Roman Catholic Association, Azion Catolica, was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 10th of March in Rome, a cook was killed by a communist organization. On the 16th of March, a judge was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 18th of March in Rome, a judge was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 19th of March in Milan, a judge was killed by a group of Prima Linea. On the 10th of April in Turin, a guard was killed by a communist extremist group. On the 28th of May in Milan, a journalist was killed by a far-right group. On the 23rd of June in Rome, a judge was killed by a far-right group. On the 31st of December in Rome, a general of the Italian police forces was killed by the Red Brigade. In the, on the 2nd of August, 1980, a bomb killed 85 people and wounded more than 200 in Bologna, known as the Bologna Massacre. The blast destroyed a large portion of the city's railway station. This was found to be carried out by a neo-fascist group in response to all the leftist assassinations that were carried out that year. On the 5th of July, a director of a petrochemical establishment was killed by the Red Brigades after being kidnapped for 47 days. On the 3rd of August, Roberto Pecci, a worker and electrician, was killed by the Red Brigades after being in their captivity for 54 days after being kidnapped. On December 17th, an American general and the deputy commander of NATO's South European forces based in Vernoa was kidnapped by the Red Brigades. He was freed on the 28th of January 1982. On the 26th of August, a group of Red Brigade terrorists attacked a military troop convoy in Salnero. In the attack, Corporal Antonio Palombo and policeman Antonio Banderia and Mario De Marco were killed. The terrorists escaped. On the 21st of October, a group of Red Brigade terrorists attacked a bank in Turin, killing two guards. On the 15th of February, an American diplomat and Director General of the International Peacekeeping Force, MFO, was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 23rd of December, a bomb in a train between Florence and Rome killed 17 and wounded more than 200. In 1992, Mafia members were sentenced to life imprisonment for the bombing. On the 9th of January, in a town near Rome, a policeman was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 27th of March in Rome, an economist was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 10th of February, 1986, former mayor of Florence was killed by the Red Brigades. On the 20th of March, 1987, a general in the Italian Air Force was assassinated by the Red Brigades in Rome. On the 16th of April, 1988, Senator Roberto Ruffelli was assassinated in an attack by a group of the Red Brigades. It was the last murder committed by the Red Brigades. On October 23rd, a group of Red Brigade members declared in a document that the war against the state was over. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, a resurgence of the Red Brigade's terrorism led to further assassinations. On the 20th of May, 1999, a consultant of the Ministry of Labor was assassinated in an attack by a group of terrorists of Red Brigades in Rome. On the 19th of March, 2002, 
Marco Biaggi, a consultant with the Ministry of Labor, was assassinated in an attack by a group of terrorists of the Red Brigades in Bologna. On March 2, 2003, a policeman was assassinated by a group of Red Brigade terrorists. In 2005, some suspected terrorists, known as the New Red Brigades, were arrested. The Mitterrand Doctrine, which established in 1985 by then-French President François Mitterrand, stated that Italian far-left terrorists who fled to France and who were convicted of violent acts in Italy, excluding active, actual, bloody terrorism during the years of lead, would receive asylum in France and would not be subject to extradition to Italy. They would be integrated into French society. Some Italian citizens accused of terrorist acts have found refuge in Brazil, such as Cesar Battisti and other former members of the Armed Proletarians for Communism, a far-left militant and terrorist organization. Some Italian far-left activists also found political asylum in Nicaragua, according to Alessio Casimiri, who took part in the kidnapping of Aldo Moro. In 2019, we aren't quite to the level of the years of lead. However, we have seen in places like America, Germany, France, etc., many violent protests from left-wing and right-wing groups. Police officers killed in politically motivated attacks, members of legitimate political groups killed or attacked with the intent of killing. We have seen very recently mail bombs sent to left-wing news outlets, suspected bombs outside of police stations, mass shootings from both left-wing and right-wing groups, truck attacks, religious extremism, the list goes on. It's easy to see these events on the news and think, that's awful, and get along with your day. Many people believe events like the Years of Lead could not happen in first world countries in the modern day, but I bet people in Italy in 1968 said the exact same thing. This type of insanity could very well happen to many first world nations, and from the looks of it, we aren't far off. The slope here is very slippery, and if normal, non-violent people don't take a stand against outright lies and inflammation of tensions from left-wing and right-wing media, as well as no longer tolerating these extreme political groups on both sides of the political spectrum, the years of lead is definitely our future. I'm not 100% sure what the right answer to stop this madness is, but I know I don't want my friends and family to live in a situation like the years of lead. All I know is those of us of sound mind cannot let these left-wing and right-wing lunatics take over the asylum. Just keep in mind that if we stay on the course we're currently on, the years of lead is without a doubt our future. One of the most frightening similarities between the modern day and the years of lead is the fact that the left-wing media heavily, heavily supports a lot of the very extreme and often violent groups such as Antifa. A lot of the right-wing groups and their talking points are roundly ignored and the, a lot of the right-wing and pro-fascist groups are relatively obscure, nobody takes them seriously, but a lot of the left-wing groups are heavily supported by media, similar to how they were in the years of lead, and it, it's, it's really scary to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think that something like the years of lead could definitely occur today, but Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please hit the like button and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. And yeah, stay safe, everyone.